Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, um, today I'm going to be talking about a method uh, that goes by the name hidden Markov modeling. Okay, um, but hidden Markov modeling, I don't like to say that my talks here are about a method. Really, hidden Markov modeling is about understanding simpler dynamical systems where there's some underlying state, we don't know what it is. But in contrast to yesterday, where the state was continuous in nature, we could have more people more susceptible or fewer, more infectives or fewer, more recovered people or fewer. Those are essentially continuous quantities. The underlying state was a vector of continuous quantities, quantities that could be represented as real numbers, non-negative real numbers for that matter. Today, we're going to be dealing with simpler systems where the underlying situation is going to be characterized by one of a set of categorical values, or nominal values, if you want to use that terminology. It's one of a set of possibilities. So maybe, am I inside or outside? Am I in a non-human powered vehicle right now? A human powered vehicle like a bike or a, you know, a scooter? That's, that's powered by, by foot, or am I in, a, uh, you know, am I, am I not on a vehicle? Um, uh, am I uh, sitting, standing, or lying down if I'm sedentary? Hmm? These, are all, um, these are all different classifications, abstractions of my current situation that we may want to understand. And today, I'm gonna to be looking specifically at understanding them using data Big data, data that's high velocity in character and increasingly common. And to help motivate this, but also to clue you in to new types of data sources, I want to talk a little bit about a system that I'm proud to have helped uh, contribute to uh, and which um, is being used for lots of exciting work at the interface of data science and health. And it's a smartphone-based data collection system uh, initiated with the um, uh, IEPI project uh, here on campus, which Winchell uh, was a, a prominent contributor uh, for. And, um, and it's now captured in, in uh, the system known as Ethica. I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about Ethica. Um, I would suggest, if anyone's interested in getting a hands-on look at it, that you go to ethicadata.com and uh, you can read about it. You could also go to the, um, the App Store, um, if you have an iPhone, the Apple Store, or you can go to uh, Google Play and download the Ethica Health app um, and uh, experiment with it. And you'll find videos of me online amongst the thousands that, that I've put out there. Um, in general, you will find these videos for, um, uh, for this material, okay? Um, and uh, today I want to give you a very brief uh, glimpse of it because it, it bears directly on the example that I'll be uh, covering, okay? Uh, Ethica was motivated by a need to fill the gaps uh, faced by my colleagues in the health sciences to address some of the more important problems out there. I work very closely with uh, health authority and with uh, Ministry of Health and past projects and, um, and with partners worldwide within the health sciences. And it's long struck me ever since I first started modeling within this area over 20 years ago, just how, how much our models, such as you saw yesterday, or their more sophisticated variants, such as those built by Qin Yang in, um, in gestational type 2 diabetes, um, with uh, much help by others, including Winshaw, um, or those built by, um, by Cheyenne here with uh, particle filtering or Wade for pertussis and chicken pox, et cetera. These are sophisticated models, but often we find that the models we can articulate today these models that capture our theory of what's going on in the world far outstrip the data we have available to us. This gap is particularly keen in a couple of areas. Understanding people's contact patterns, important for transmission of pathogen, but also transmission of norms, attitudes, beliefs, ideas. 
where people are spending their time, location. For example, for communities struggling with higher levels of obesity, understanding which aspects of the environment discourage physical activity, almost require sedentary behavior, or understanding the community safety side of it. Issues having to do with nutrition intake, what people are eating, and when they're eating it, with whom they're eating it. There's some evidence of big impacts on how much we eat, depending on with whom we're eating. Aspects of physical activity. We know since the Anhangs 3 study in the 1980s, there's a huge gap between what people say they expect in terms of physical activity and what they do. Accelerometry, heart rate measurements, these days show big gaps. These are just a few of many areas. Communicational behavior is another. And when it comes to healthcare, often we have intricate information about a person when they have contact with the healthcare system, like their electronic health record or medical record, the administrative data. But when they go into the community, where most of care is delivered at home by family members, by self-care, and where they live for most of the time, there's a big gap often for what's going on, where their trajectory leads. To help fill these gaps, we started on the IEP project back in 2009-2010 to leverage mobile technologies. And for most of the time, it's been mobile phones to try to help collect information that could give us insight into these patterns of health, particularly these, um, these um, uh, less well understood areas of health. So Ethica is the latest and premier encapsulation of the results of this. And it's built by my exceptional colleague and former student, uh, Mohammed Hashemian, who actually happens to be on campus at the moment. Um, uh, even though it's based out of uh, Kitchener, um, out, in, um, out in Ontario. It's software, so Ethica software allows researchers to collect and analyze data related to human behavior, ex exposures, data attitudes, beliefs, using uh, smartphones, wearable technologies, and uh, now in a, in a big breakthrough with web as well. It's been used for over 100 studies, more than 10,000 participants in eight countries. It's available in nine languages and used in some, like Bengali, as, as uh, Rifat could tell you, even though the Ethica interface is not fully available there. Ethica consists basically of a system by which you can create quite customized studies or deployments for your area of interest without programming. You can then deploy those studies to devices, such as Android and iOS smartphones, uh, or to the web, as it turns out now. Um, and participants can interact with them. They can also interact with wearables. And uh, researchers can, can uh, examine the data as it comes in, monitor adherence, um, and change the study if required. So it, turn, it, it turns something that might require a year of custom software development into might, something that might require a day or two of preparation to get a very rough version of it. You can push it out there, do pilot tests, see what's acceptable, see what works, what doesn't work, what's problematic, what's too burdensome, what's not providing enough uh, insight, and modify the instruments very quickly and nimbly and iterate. And it, and it takes us out of the loop. One of my fondest jobs is to, to put myself out of a job. Yes? So Ethica is kind of like, is it kind of survey tools? Like you can make your own survey and collect the data? It does do that. All, you can define them graphically in there and um, uh, through a survey editor. You can do not only traditional survey instruments. And by the way, it's great to see you, Sabu. Thank oh, you. It is such a pleasure. Um, I, I, I apologize for not, not seeing you earlier. Yeah, uh, uh, um, it's it's uh, wonderful. So um, so Ethica has a very sophisticated survey system that includes traditional instruments like Likert scales, um, such as visual analog scales. Um, you know where people could drag and say how much pain do you feel between zero and one hundred, etc. Um, um, multiple choice questions, um, multi-answer questions. So 
you can have multiple tick boxes, you know, full, free form text, but it uses innovative um, um, uh, types of questions as well. So audio, or where you can choose to give an audio answer or a textual answer. Um, uh, height and weight, where you can choose your units, for example. Um, uh, video, so I can submit video showing a barrier I'm facing as a disabled person for getting to my healthcare destination. Uh, pictures, so I can show a picture of the tick I found and an expert could identify it, or show a picture of my rash. Um, maybe I record my COPD exacerbation, my coughing and wheezing, so that a clinician can better understand it. All this is part of what we call the surveys. And those surveys can be triggered by location or by proximity. For example, we could trigger a survey when I'm near, when I haven't been near my service dog for a long period of time, or when I am near my prosthetic limb, um, and and ask questions that are very low burdensome because they're only asked at the right times or close to the right times. I can ask a question when I'm in a park about park going experiences, or when I haven't been in a park for a long time about something like that. So yes, surveys, but in a way that leverages the unique power of sensors and uh, sensor-based mechanisms like photos, if that's helpful. Yeah. So in that case, like it has yeah. like it can capture video or picture or anything, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it will be like converted to the data like a real like either the numeric or Yeah, it's it's all well it's all linked in with other aspects that are collected from this data. These data sources are typically um, Sensor data, for example, maybe we record for adolescents how much screen time they're recording and um, what apps they're using. Or maybe for individuals um, where we're interested in the struggles they have in getting access to care, you know, to capture their geographic patterns with GPS. Or maybe we're interested in the um, impact of the physical environment on physical activity and sensory behavior. We're recording accelerometry and um, and aspects of their um, movement as, as quantified with uh, step counters and with, uh, with gyroscopes. And um, that, that would be additional data, and all of this is cross-linked within Ethica. Okay. In that case, look at that. Yeah. So like in Canadian prospect, like suppose something we need to link the data to mm. the MDB, like having the CCS data. Right? Yeah, yeah. So Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we do this all the time with data collected by Ethica, linking it to external data such as clinical data, for an individual administrative data, um, data from external survey instruments, et cetera. And I would note, if anyone's interested in learning more about this, because I'm going to have to go light so I can get on to hidden Markov models, but um, could my students who have worked with one just left, um, could my student, he was prescient, um, could, uh, could my students who have worked with Ethica raise their hands so that um, people could know who they are? Uh, Tim Young, get, get your hand up. Uh, I guess John Young hasn't worked too much with it. Um, yeah, Jenna, Jenna's done some great work with it. Um, you can find out more from them, and uh, they could walk you through it. There's also videos of me. Um, if you want to engage in real misfortune, you could use videos of me online where I introduce Ethica. There's a half hour one where I systematically walk through creating a study with Ethica, pushing it out to phone, seeing what it looks like, modifying the study, seeing the data that's coming back over time, etc. And you can find that uh, through my YouTube channel. What's the motivation for participants? Motivation uh, varies a lot. So all participants go through a consent process and they're recruited. Different studies will have different motivations, okay? There are some studies where uh, there is a direct impact on um, the lives of the participants for the information gathered. And it's a patient-oriented research type of project where the patients have a, recognize they have a stake in the game. For example, work Jen is doing with veterans with service dogs. These are veterans who, who have uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and are dealing with um, uh, challenges, uh, mental health and addictions challenges. And it is a patient-run study in the sense that um, amongst the, the group carrying the phone are some of the leaders, and they are using it to try to understand the varied effects of service dogs on patients like them, because it changes so many things. You know, um, 
Maybe, maybe the patient's better after it. With traditional instruments, we don't necessarily know why. But here we can track, for example, how much time after getting the service dog um, uh, is the veteran spending outside versus inside. To what degree is their schedule much more regular? To what degree are they um, uh, engaged in more moderate, vigorous physical activity uh, or, or sedentary behavior? To what degree are they seeing others more? Uh, to what degree are flashbacks occurring? Um, these are types of things that with wearables, like they're using them in Fitbits, um, and with the data from the phone, and we have beacons on the dogs. This is all stock Ethica stuff. Um, Ethica can record distance to beacons in the presence of a beacon. <coughs> we can capture information about the proximity of the dog to the veteran by extension, how long they're spending with the veteran. Uh, over time. And the veterans have an, have an interest in understanding this because they, they're actually the ones, they're involved in running this program to pair service dogs with veterans. And they want to improve that program and get more out of it for their personal lives. So that's an example. Another example is community motivation. So for example, the SMART study run with Tarun Katapali, an up and coming uh, researcher of, of great note at University of Virginia. Um, uh, has community members volunteering information on um, barriers and supports for physical activity in their neighborhood, which are then shared online. So it's like a community mapping project where they have a stake in the game to highlight opportunities for improving their community, highlighting areas that city planners might, might work to improve, like cracked sidewalks, for example, that could help the lives of, of themselves and, and those around them. Other studies, though, are more um, are more traditional. You know, the recruiters. So I, I mentioned 100 plus studies. Um, there, there are some studies where the researchers involved um, have recruited participants as part of a much bigger study. For example, a Media Ticino study in Lugano, Switzerland, um, uh, has a much bigger cohort of, of teens in school. And uh, through an assent and consent process, a subset of them carry ethic on their phones to track um, uh, their screen time, sedentary behavior, moods, um, uh, irritability, um, the apps that they're using, et cetera. And uh, the parents and kids do receive some compensation and some, um, some funds that, that compensate them for their time which is a, a common feature of many of these studies. Um, you, you, you want to provide people recognition of the fact they're spending time answering the questions, they're, they're, they're volunteering some information. So there's a, um, a recruitment process which takes place with different motivations. You know, in other cases of patients in a facility whose care is tied up with this, um, for example, patients who, who are suffering from COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, coughing and wheezing, and they'd like to contribute to research that lowers the burden of COPD and helps better manage, you know, better advice about when to take medications, et cetera. So they too have a desire to give back, not necessarily for their own care, but to give back to the community, which is a prominent feature of patient experience for those living with chronic disease. Not just how can I manage my condition, but how can I help others manage their conditions more effectively? So it varies a lot by study to study, but those are some of the some of the motivations, and um, you know you'll find uh, you'll find others as well um, out there. Other questions? Yeah, Sabu. Am I to ask one question? Sorry. Am I allowed to ask oh, one question? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. One thing in my mind. So probably. You can explain better. But I think there should be a bias because, like, suppose I have a smartphone, so I can use that, right? Mm -hmm. But if we think about senior people, they may not have this phone, mm -hmm. or people living remotely, yes, they may not have this access. Mm -hmm. So, in that case, is it like biased toward the well? Good question. Or, sorry, a good question. Great question. Or towards uh, like bias generation, like suppose the university student, mm -hmm. like, because student most of them they are. With this screen time most of the time. And, and the, absolutely. Not the bad way, because they, they are one no. and uh, is, is study everything. So I should correct a misconception. Ethica doesn't require ongoing connectivity. So it'll work for weeks without being connected to a network. 
So it's not like it requires you to be on a 3G network or something like that. And, and in fact, some of the uses of Ethica early on were in very remote communities like Lawash, for example, in northern Saskatchewan. And we do a lot of work with, with, with individuals who don't necessarily have a lot of connectivity, lower SES individuals or socioeconomic position. Some of Ethica's biggest studies, including a very large study of thousands of participants in the US Bay Area, have been with, um, with lower income populations um, very successfully. Um, and some of the work we've done with Harvard you know, on, on the burdens of, of, of smoking and tobacco um, have been with uh, low income populations in multiple communities in the states. And generally, we see a lot of um, a lot of willingness to participate there. There are different barriers. I won't go into it here because there's not time. Yeah. But um, but uh, you're absolutely right. Th the question that you're asking is a very good one and an important one uh, about bias. And I would argue that all of us need to recognize there is bias in data collection of whatever sort, and we need to help um, uh, be explicit about that, to help to work to counteract it where possible, to compensate for that bias. Much of the motivation for many of our partners for using Ethica is actually to overcome bias in other forms. I'll give you an example. Large-scale random digit dialing is conducted, uh, surveys conducted by provincial partners they depend on calling people at home. And people think, well, it's a representative sample. You call random households. I don't like to swear, so I won't. I won't. But um, it's nonsense, OK? Um, increase, and, and the people who run these studies are, are deeply aware of that these days. Random digit dialing is incredibly, incredibly biased. The people you tend to get who pick up the phone are not average. The population of people are at home a lot, and often people who want someone to talk to, um, often people who are not really savvy about screening calls, you tend to get a very lot of older individuals who are seeking social companionship, who are willing to go through a 100-question survey over the phone, partly out of you know, a willingness to do something, partly because they don't have a lot of competing activities, partly for someone to talk to sometimes. Um, all of our data collection activities have bias. The important thing is to recognize what those risks are and to work to overcome them and to, to recognize where they might and how much they might affect our analyses. And Ethica is no exception. We go through extraordinary measures with many of our studies. For example, handing out phones to individuals who are homeless in Regina with whom we're working to make sure that everyone can be um, uh, can be included in the study. Um, to be able to, to offer people with an older phone the option of upgrading to a newer model because sometimes individuals with older phones are too packed with pictures and other things to fit certain software. And so we have to be explicit about this. And you're absolutely right that age is, is a major barrier. Jenna is working, for example, right now on a study um, for caregivers of those with dementia. And that's actually a big uh, concern also for our study with respirology on, on COPD, um, uh, another issue. Um, wearable technologies, such as those uh, available in mass market through things like Fitbit, Jogon, and others, but also uh, Aura, um, a company uh, uh, pioneered by Cerise Salanders, with help by Jenny Basran, um, uh, another company building wearables for elderly. Um, attractive wearables, wearables that look like jewelry, but can be used uh, with smartphone-based systems to collect data and provide caregivers and loved ones with uh, confidence their, their loved one is to be treated, uh, treated well. So very good question, very important question. If you want to learn more of th about this in a serious way, come to our boot camp next week, um, which is held here on campus. Three days boot camp and incubator, you will walk out of there with a study on your phone, ready for deployment to iPhone and Android, uh, potentially using wearables, et cetera. Okay? So, so think about that for anyone who's seriously interested. So Ethica collects a wide variety of data. Um, this includes data about those issues I mentioned that are hard to get. Things like physical activity, sedentary behavior, where people spend time with whom, et cetera. Um, and I won't go into it, but in Ethica, you can pick from some 
27 different data sources right now, and they include things like Google Fit devices, et cetera. Um, and so when configuring a study, a custom study, you choose the data sources for that study. You choose the consent, can provide consent information for the study. There needs to be a consent process for this to be done ethically. Um, and define the surveys, et cetera. So you have surveys that can be, so there are certain things that run in the background, like step counts or um, uh, GPS or aspects of uh, Bluetooth, uh, so distance, you know, recording contact with the dog, for example, or with a, with a, um, a child or with a, a resource like the, the pill cart. Um, uh, but certain activities participants uh, engage in, for example, filling out surveys, cognitive tasks, recording their activity, um, uh, what they're eating, um, tracking their expenses. These are a set of ethical extensions which are increasingly prominent. Even things to connect a participant with those associated with the study for social support, for chat, for clarifying questions, to address any concerns. There's a, a, a chat type of interface. Um, uh, users can have buttons to indicate things proactively, like I'm taking medication or I, I you know, I, my, my leg is really hurting this morning or I'm feeling sick or, you know, I'm, I'm presenting for care. Um, and they can, uh, things can be uh, triggered at certain times. We can capture network information using Bluetooth beacons um, and uh, trigger surveys based on that. We can also trigger surveys based on, uh, on uh, GPS mechanisms. Um, and uh, there's an interface for, for, com um, uh, for, for configuring those. Uh, Ethica allows for configuring, uh, for, for monitoring data as it comes in from the system and understand where people are keeping up with the surveys or keeping up with the data offered, offering GPS, for example, and where they might need to be nudged. And Ethica can summarize this data in a wide variety of forms, some through built-in um, data summary type of mechanisms, um, you can build a custom dashboard for your study that keeps up to date with custom visualizations. You can also use some built-in visualizations, uh, such as for, um, for mapping out activities uh, uh, over space. And some of these displays link data from multiple sorts. This is where the variety of big data comes in. We talked about data, you may recall, yesterday from this very floor, I talked about big data being defined not just by the big part, the volume, but by the velocity, by the variety, and by the veracity. So it is here, we can combine a high variety of ways different of these types of information because we, we know they're collected for this participant at this time. And for example, we can map out where they made certain responses to a survey. Uh, where they where they answered that survey, or where they engaged in high levels of physical activity, for example. Um, yes. Yes. You can do inpatient, outpatient. We have lots of studies in patients, lots of patients, lots of studies. Someone in the hospital, like from the data from the hospital, the No. No. No, you're not going to be able to get step counts from the hospital. Okay. You're not going to be able to get how long their loved ones were with them. You're not going to be able to get aspects of you know their um, of their social communication, phone calls received or made. There's certain. You're absolutely right that in facilities, yes. in during contacts with healthcare systems, uh, from EHRs, uh, electronic medical records, um, and, you know, more derived things from billing data, like administrative information. We can often get a lot of information, but there's huge gaps in our understanding of some of the, the most detailed aspects of, of, of human behavior. You know, the, the hospital doesn't keep track how many times a patient, a COPD patient in the hospital has gone out for a smoke, yeah. right? Um, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things which might affect their prognosis, their recovery, for example, that go through the cracks. Do they have a social support network that's provided there? Do they have someone who's um, present in learning about the care being administered so that when they go back into the community, they're able to, um, um, to apply those, uh, those care techniques? This information is not captured in, 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 in any sort of form formally. 
And often doctors and nurses just don't have time to record, you know, how many steps a patient's taking, even though we know patient mobility yeah. in hospital, in, in a care environment, has a huge impact on their likelihood of successfully recovering. It's not captured. This is why Jenny Basram, for example, used Ethica's predecessor um, over many, many years ago to capture mobility information, probably six, seven years ago now, um, to capture that. So this type of information can be of use for clinical management, um, for, for clinicians to understand self-care, um, patient challenges uh, in the home, outside, et cetera, but also to understand outcomes, both patient reported and those recorded automatically. You know, how many, um, and our respirology colleagues, they would like to know how many exacerbations, how many coughing fits is a COPD patient gathering? That won't necessarily be recorded even in hospital. But when they go out to the community, forget it. You know, they just depend on occasional self-report. And it's often recall bias people can't remember. This can allow recording of it. It can help provide a baseline, as Jenny says, a fingerprint of function. Health service delivery, we can capture information there. Operational decisions uh, can be informed by this and, and strategic decision making. Um, so, yes. We can support the board that this one is the answer. Mm -hmm. You only get that information. But other than that, like, as we say, uh, any clinical information we cannot get because this not be possible by getting this, right? I'm sorry? To get what? Any clinical information. Oh, no. We no, we're not going to be getting clinical information except if it's externally linked. So Ethica allows um, an interface for, for looking at this data collected by Ethica, but it also allows you to export the data. And in fact, many of my students here have conducted analysis which links Ethica data to other data not in Ethica. Um, for example, clinical information. Um, my student Tina Thomas um, uh, is does a lot of work linking it to you know external information, or we'll link it up with uh, clinical clinical data for a patient, which is stored externally. Um, and but my our our understanding of the clinical outcomes might be informed by what we pick up on Ethica. Okay, so so you do the cross linkage. Um, using the patient identifiers and some master list if you have external data. Um, there are moves afoot for larger cohorts, larger panel studies that are being conducted worldwide to have the external data for that panel study be maintained as well in Ethica. Okay? Um, but um, so pulling some of the external data into Ethica is the direction that Ethica is going right now to ease that analysis and visualization. <laughs> If anyone is, is, is interested in looking at it, again, there's tons of material I have online, or come to our boot camp next week in Incubator, and you can learn all about this system, okay? Um, which is very popular and uh, of growing, uh, growing power. But this morning, with your permission, I want to move on to applications of this system. I'm conscious of the time, and I will need to be very strict about my uh, time today, ideally even ending a couple minutes early because of a, uh, of, of a phone call for a grant which I'm co-PIing involving AI and, and public health. Um, so uh, I'm gonna have to, to, to get out uh, pretty quickly. This afternoon, by contrast, I can be here till the cows come home. Um, so I'll be looking forward to engaging more informally for anyone who has questions. But let's use the next hour well. If it's OK, I welcome these questions. I will look forward to answering more this afternoon. I want to talk about hidden Markov modeling. I want to talk about hidden Markov modeling for a particular need, though. And um, I'm going to introduce this right, right now um, using actually a separate deck of slides. And then we will, we will come back to, uh, to this one. So. This deck of slides will give a sense of the motivation, and we will then talk about hidden Markov models a little bit more and more formally. So the most the motivation here for this work, which was conducted with um, a very talented undergraduate at the time, William Vanderkamp, who's um, uh, right now a staff member, um, was to use Ethica. It was actually a predecessor of Ethica called IEPI which uh, came out of our, our own in another lab, to, um, to recognize aspects of human activity. 
This is occurring in the context of um, a growing recognition that when it comes to behavior that nominally is sedentary, like you know, not moving around, engaging in moderate, vigorous physical activity, there can actually be a big difference in the healthiness, for example, of sitting all day or standing, having a standing desk or a sitting desk. For many years, it was viewed as, as, as sort of a minor matter. The real matter was, you know, how many stairs you climb and how many steps you're walking and the amount of running you're doing, or moderate to vigorous physical activity. And recent research uh, within the past half decade has pointed at this issue of, um, of, of even your, your activities uh, while sedentary is, is important, or, or while, while still. Um, and uh, what we were interested in pursuing here was the degree to which we could use data from smartphones. This is before Ethica got really into wearables. Um, to, to try to identify the types of behavior, particular types of still behavior in which people are engaged, to distinguish, say, standing from sitting, from lying down, versus all other types of activity, versus times where the phone's not even being carried, it's just sitting on a desk. We don't want to say someone's really sedentary just because their phone is you know, sitting here, or sitting in a backpack. We don't want to say, oh, they're a very sedentary person. We don't, we don't have evidence, right? Their phone is off person. Maybe it's because they're going and running laps or because they're swimming and they can't bring their phone with them and it's in the locker. So we're interested in using smartphones to probe this. And this is a very small study. Um, and we had a custom interface. This is, again, I the Ethica predecessor. It's kind of Ethica's daddy. Who's its daddy? It's all you have Well, <laughs> um, Ethica's, Ethica's predecessor, and it was, uh, it was more like, um, yeah, it was, it was more like, you know, pre-human. It was more like Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. This was a much more simple system. It was Android only. Ethica is, is now um, Android, iPhone, and web. Um, but we had a custom interface to it which allowed people to record ground truth information related to their posture. So the idea is, look, could we collect a ground truth data set that would allow us to then derive um, um, models, um, uh, so machine learning models, that, would, that might allow us to infer to train those models to allow us to infer what the underlying activity was and using ground truth data, using labeled data, data that's explicitly recorded what the true underlying situation is, we could have some basis for training and for evaluating, for, for, um, uh, for, for judging and going through a cross-validation process the uh, accuracy of these underlying machine learning models. Okay. Um, so uh, this interface uh, had a bunch of questions. You can see them there. Where's the phone in the body? Uh, what's the current posture? Are they in a motorized vehicle? Why would you ask that? Well, if we're trying to figure out, for example, if someone's sitting down or standing up, um, our interpretation of the data might be affected if they are in a vehicle. Imagine if they're in a, I remember traveling to do canoeing up in Mississippi. For those not familiar with it, it's in northern Saskatchewan, and it's kind of a cobble road up there, and the truck is going And I was recording with the system at the time, you know, I'm sitting, but it was good I could record, I'm, I'm in a vehicle, because the data that people would have looked at, they would have said, well, that's not sitting data. Look at all this movement going on. You know, he's engaged in, in vigorous, you know, vigorous activity, but it's not the case. It's just, I was sitting, but I was in a vehicle. So we recorded aspect that are indoors, outdoors, and then you can enter a comment. I entered the comment truck on, on gravel road, as I recall. But, um, so the idea is we could uh, record these things in each one at a set of, set of possible answers. Um, Okay, so for example, current activity, biking, walking, standing, unsupported. We distinguish between you know, standing supported like this versus standing unsupported because we figured it might bear on the, uh, the movement patterns encountered. Um, 
you know, uh, various, uh, various other questions. And we could start the interface here um, and stop. So we, we would have these intervals of time where it was clearly labeled with respect to all of these issues. Um, and we could also, like if we forgot, this would sometimes happen. I get a phone call and, you know, oh my gosh, I gotta go get the lecture. I forgot, I thought it was a half hour later, so I'd run over to the lecture and then, I'd, oh my gosh, I, I still think I'm sitting, you know. Um, and so I'd say stop and forget all that data or throw it away because it's corrupted. You know, it's corrupted by misclassification. Um, and, um, and then finally you could say I'm putting down the phone. Um, and, and that means it's going off person. Hey, uh, there's no meaningful activity I need to indicate because it's not on my person. It's in my backpack, my pocketbook, my, it's on the counter, what have you. Um, now, we capture a wide set of data um, from the infrared phones. Um, some of them were, were not germane. Um, things like, humidity, temperature, and pressure, not germane for this discussion, quite germane for indoor outdoor. Turns out there's pressure differentials indoor outdoor. Um, turns out that humidity is quite different indoor outdoor, um, et cetera. Um, but some of them are, are highly, uh, highly relevant, like linear acceleration, rotational speed, the roll and pitch of the phone, kind of the angle of it um, is quite, quite useful to understand. Um, and um, there's a, a, a notable feature of this data was that each data point that was recorded was quite varied. A fair bit of variability around, around some level. Um, often any one data point will be fairly ambiguous. Am I sitting or am I engaged in a supported standing line? Not clear from any one data point. Maybe I'm just really still <coughs> standing here. Or maybe I'm sitting. Um, or maybe I'm sitting and swiveling the chair, and it's not clear if I'm, you know, getting up and walking or swiveling the chair, right? Um, at the same time, and thinking in terms of human activity, um, I know I, I'm, a, I, I'm told that I'm a fairly dynamic lecturer in the sense of moving around. Um, I have another colleague with whom I do That's research right. who. That's right. Who, I have another colleague with whom I do research who, whose pattern is exactly the opposite. He will stand for like an hour straight in exactly one place. And when he wants to emphasize something, you know, at like two or three points in the lecture, the most important things he will make like a step to the right or a step to the left. And that will signal like, okay, gotta really pay attention here. You know, um, it's dramatic. My style uh, exhibits um, a measure of difference from that. Um, but even I am not engaged in, you know, changing my posture every second or something like that. You know, I know you might think I can jump up, but, but there's a human limit to things, right? I'm not lying down and, and you, know, you know, sleeping for a second and then leaping up and running and biking and <laughs> we really need that. Um, uh, but, um, but the point is there's many observations, each, in each individual observation is ambiguous, but there's many observations per time step, okay? Or per activity before it switches. You know, I'll, uh, I may be sitting on this desk for five minutes, but I might have thousands of data points in those five minutes that come in. Each of those data points might be ambiguous, but collectively, if you look at them in sequence, they give a picture of a less, a less active thing than if I'm you know, running over here to show something on the screen, okay? So what I'm saying is individual data points are ambiguous, collectively, once you consider their temporal context, often they start to give a consistent picture. And if you look at this, this is 3D rotational speed on the x-axis. This is for a participant for whom the data was, was particularly good. And you can see for standing behavior, there's a distribution. It, it actually looks quite exponential. It, it's a very high peak here. Most of the time is lower levels of activity for standing. 
But there's a long tail on the upper side here. Sitting, lower energy, right? So there's less rotational motion. It's concentrated in the lower level of, of rotational motion. So it, it's, it's, it's more tight, and there's less high activity while sitting. You might wonder, what, what is this? You know, what's, well, again, I swivel my chair, or I pull in closer to the desk, or push back, or what have you. Move around in my chair a bit, right? Adjust it, reach for the phone, and it moves me. Um, and, and then off person, you'll notice, is, is quite tight. Um, you might say, that should be zero. There, there must be some data quality problem. No, not necessarily. Maybe I have, it's not a good example here, but maybe um, you know, if I had a chair up here and this was off person, the chair gets, um, gets moved about as I'm moving about the office, the chair gets moved a bit. Or maybe this is in a car or a bus. And this is sitting on the bus seat next to me. It's off person, but the bus is moving. And so there's some motion in the surrounding environment. Okay. So, so the point is, um, there's distributions. The distributions are highly overlapped. What we sought to do here was to use an underlying Markov chain. So the idea is, look, the observations are whispers. Each observation is an ambiguous whisper about the underlying situation. But there is some underlying situation. And we want to use those individually confusing whispers in context, taken together, to give a picture about what's going on in the underlying system, to probe the underlying state with the conviction that the whispers that you hear in these different states, whilst individually ambiguous, will, will over time collectively be pretty convincing about what's going on. Okay? So the idea is we're in some underlying state. You could see them diagrammed here. William did a great job with these. So this is from ICHI 2007, and the International Conference on Health Informatics, for those who are interested. Um, so the idea was to give an underlying situation of standing, walking, sitting, off person. OK? Um, actually, I think the, the walking is actually uh, active, so meaning like not not sedentary, not, not just sitting in one, not uh, being, uh, not, not merely remaining in one place, okay? And the idea is there's some underlying state and there's some movement between st the states. So this underlying situation is probably the same for a while, maybe seconds, minutes, hours, if your phone is sitting, for example, charging overnight whilst you sleep. But then, over time, the underlying situation changes. And it changes in some way that um, is somewhat structured. So, you know, for example, um, uh, you might go from sitting to, um, sitting to standing, interestingly. Um, sitting to standing, I'm not sure why that linkage isn't here. That's probably a bug in this diagram. Sitting to standing, more commonly than you immediately go uh, sitting and, and, you know, walking away. Um, so there are certain types of structured transitions. Now, we illustrate this with what's called the transition probability <coughs> matrix. So the idea is there's discrete time assumed. Uh, and it, we, we consider one-second intervals, I believe it was, for this project. And in any one-second interval, we'll say, we'll view us as being in a certain state. And if we consider over time for different one second intervals, um, there'll be some chance, there'll be a certain probability per one second interval that the phone will go, for example, from being off person to, um, to being held by a person in a, in a sitting state. And then if I'm in a sitting state, maybe I check my phone and pick it up. I see the notification that went off. I say, oh, I don't have to worry about that. That was canceled. And I put down the phone. That might be a round trip of five seconds, but it involves switching between states. Or maybe I pick up the phone to a standing position, and then I start walking. And I switch states, and maybe I'm walking for 10 minutes. And then I come to my destination, and maybe I sit down, right? 
So there's some switch between these underlying situation and we quantize time into these uh, fixed times. And so in a given period of time, we could consider the current state and the next state. So maybe if I'm off person with 95% confidence within, this, is, this looks like it's articulated for something more than a second, say it's five minutes, 95% confidence I'm gonna stay, it's gonna stay off person. So on average, I, I won't go through the mathematics, but this implies on average, if, if each thing is five seconds, it would imply that uh, one out of every 100 minutes on average. I, I spent, it spends about 100 minutes on average off person. So 95% chance if I'm currently off, that is currently off person, it'll stay off person the next time you step. 2% um, uh, chance uh, it'll go to a person who's standing, who is sitting versus standing versus walking. You notice these probabilities sum up to one because you gotta go somewhere in the next time step, either here stay here or go here or go here or go here. Um, and so they sum up to one, right? Collective, they're collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive next steps based on where you currently are. Similarly for, for walking. Okay. Um, so the idea is you model this transition using that. Now, this is a Markov transition matrix and it's a particularly simplistic one. It exhibits a memoryless process. Well, uh, to, to, to make that intuitive, what I'm saying is these probabilities are, are treated as if they are independent of how long you've spent in that time. Now, if we were to go to more sophisticated models, like the models we saw yesterday, we could do something more fancy, but it turns out estimating it is more complicated. Um, this is memoryless. So it posits no matter how long you've been off person, the chance is the same in the next little bit that you, that, you, know, you will transition in these various, various ways. And the idea here is, look, you have some underlying state and um, it's, it's modeled by this, uh, this matrix. So over time we move in this sort of way and this matrix will capture that. Um, and the underlying state whispers of the underlying situation, but in an ambiguous way. So maybe in the underlying situation associated with each of these states, there's some distribution for how for the sensor measurements. Okay, um, here we're just uh, for illustration. It's, it's purely univariate, but later we'll deal with with multiple um, multiple variables. And this analysis essentially drew on multiple variables. Um, but here, imagine if it's univariate, so there's only one variable. Maybe, you know, in a standing state, I sample from one distribution. Um, uh, in a walking state, you know, there's a different distribution associated with my, or an active state associated with my movement patterns as picked up by the sensor. With sitting, there's another one yet. And the idea is that each of these measurements is ambiguous. Maybe shifting in my chair, or maybe, you know, um, reaching for the phone while still sitting. Or maybe I'm walking and I'm, I'm you know, I'm walking slowly because there's a crowd in front of me, so I have to walk kind of slowly, so I'm less vigorous in my walk. Um, and each of these measurements is ambiguous, but the hope is by putting together multiple of them, putting it in context, I'll be able to infer what state I'm probably in because maybe one or two, or et cetera, is a fluke, but collectively it should be pretty clear, especially given the fact that I don't tend to change my behavior, you know, like once a second. It, it's, it's much more structured than that, right? So these measurements are individually ambiguous. They could occur, like maybe I'm in a, you know, a, 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 a sitting state here, a measurement comes in, am I sitting or standing or lying down? I don't know, is it off person? Maybe, maybe it's kind of in the upper end of that distribution. It's a bit low for sitting. It's, it's low for standing, but weirder things have happened. Um, oh, oh, there's another measurement. Okay, standing, sitting, you want a wager? Oh, okay, okay. Okay, now, now we're, to, oh, okay, look at that. That's really high. Chances are that the probability of that occurring tends to be very low unless I'm either standing or walking. So collectively, 
these measurements, well, any one of them is ambiguous. Collectively, they point to, to a situation. And a situation where the underlying situation, the under, whether I'm standing, sitting, is changing slowly. So I can capture that context to clue me in from many measurements without fear, that, oh, the situation changed, right? Um, it's not too much fear the situation has changed. Um, so generally, it's a good plan. Now, there's some flies in the ointment. In this study, there were actually several flies in the ointment. I, apologies, I'm going to continue my breakfast. Ah, so one of the challenges here is that what HMMs posit, which is all laid out for you in a, in a, in a quite, quite systematic little set of slides that I created here, and if there's by acclamation, I could do it this afternoon. Um, but I'm only covering it briefly here. There's an assumption that while you are in any one state, like while I'm in this state here, my, or let's take this state, because I'm, you know, this, this, this uh, chap, or say, say this one, this one here, because this is sitting um, uh, for four time steps. So maybe this is four, you know, five second intervals. Um, the assumption is while you're in that state, the measurements are conditionally independent. You may say, well, what's this conditional independence? You have a notion of independence statistically, right? You could say this is independent of that statistically. There's no information about one or the other. Um, but the variation in one doesn't tell you anything about the variation in the other. I would say these are conditionally independent. Anyone have a clue why conditional? It's conditional, they're independent, conditional on you being in that state. So th there's dependence between this, this x8, that observation, x8, or that's, it's actually an observation, so it's y8 and y7. x is the underlying situation, uh, categorical. The, the y is the continuous measurement here. So y8 and y7 and y9 and y10, those observations, like in terms of the accelerometry received, the, the magnitude of the accelerometer, those are not independent of one another. Those are not independent. Um, they're actually highly dependent. But they're highly dependent on each other by virtue of the fact that they're all in a sitting state. They've been produced through a sitting state. So as long as, if, if you consider within the context of sitting, those vary independently. They're conditionally independent because they're independent, conditional on being in a sitting state. They are independent of each other measurements. Um, they're not independent in an absolute sense because they're statistically correlated or they're statistically dependent because once you're in the state, you tend to get like low measurements associated with it. So, so they're not independent of each other in a, in a, in a complete absolute sense. They're independent of each other, uh, each other given that you're being in the sitting state. The fact that you're entering a sitting state is going to tell you a lot about the subsequent measurements. They're not independent in that sense, but they're independent given that you're in a sitting state. How they vary, how the last one varied, tells you nothing <coughs> about how the next one will vary around the distribution for that state. Okay. Um, so the assumption here is there's no within state autocorrelation. And what we found is our data violated that assumption. There's actually quite a bit of seeming in-state correlation. Quite a lot of correlation within what was recorded as the same state, say sitting. We'd see a lot of variation. Like in other words, if we looked at the autocorrelation of this sample with the next few samples, there's a lot of correlation. And long story short, this gave us a big quandary for a while. Uh, and truth is, it was screwing up the analysis. Um, we, we weren't getting very good results out of the analysis. But what happened is we ended up finding data quality. This fact clued us in. In fact, there was a big data quality problem. We found that some of the participants 
had neglected to tell us when they switched states. Remember they're recording ground truth information? They're saying, I'm standing now, I'm sitting now, I'm switching off person. They wouldn't do it, they forgot. And so what nominally was, uh, say, a sitting period, had lots of auto correlation because within it, there were actually periods where, you know, it was off person and they did, hadn't recorded it, where they were walking and they didn't record it. So there'd be these long periods which are very similar to one another. Uh, and and uh, it was a problem associated with them forgetting to indicate it was a different state. Okay. Um, it turns out a lot of other investigation was also needed. We created, and this is a very useful thing to do. Those models that I talked about yesterday, those dynamic models, um, you can use them to create synthetic data that is very similar to the data you see from the world, but where you know the underlying situation is such and such. Um, so for example, we could create a little agent-based model which outputs data just like we were getting from the smartphone, but where there was mislabeling going on. Where um, at a given time, um, uh, someone might say, okay, I'm in the sitting state for a long period of time, but there'd actually be secretly transitions to other states they wouldn't record. So we had a simulation model put out data as if that were the case. And we compared how would our HMM do in classifying that situation? What would it look like autocorrelation wise compared to a situation where they were very, very calm, very, very strict in their classification? We found a big difference. In short, we used what's called in statistics a simulation experiment to create data with certain characteristics similar to what we see, might see from the world and tested how well our HMMs work on data that was corrupted in this way or, or, or impure in that way or violated this assumption. And that gave us a great deal of confidence that what was going on is that certain participants, not all, but certain participants had mislabeled their data, had failed to record, say, when they picked up a phone that was marked off person. They would fail to record it for a couple hours. And we'd see all these wild things going on, an off person phone. They just went to class with it, they forgot, and then they said, oops, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm no longer off person. And, and it was corrupting the data. And what we saw with the synthetic data from a, a, a simulation exactly mimicked that. It, it very closely mimicked those patterns. Okay? Um, so we, we ended up using data. Um, uh, for multiple participants, we ended up winnowing it down to a smaller set. And one of the ways that we operated with this, which should be familiar from the lectures last week, is through cross-validation. Okay? So we took data and we segregated it to two to different groups. I think we used two groups for this particular study. We didn't do a large N for N-fold cross-validation. We just did it with, with two groups, I think it was. And it was more complicated because it was temporal data. It's not like you could select any one tenth of the data at random. And say we're going to calibrate it for this data and keep the rest for testing or something like that. It doesn't work that way because an HMM depends on continuous data. So we divide it to, to you know different halves or three quarters for for training and one quarter for testing, something along those lines. I can't remember the exact proportion. But the basic deal is we separated some data for training. We trained the model based on it. And that involved training the distributions. And I'm trying to, trying to remember, uh, the transition probability matrix, I think, was also trained based on that data. Yeah. And then we would test the model's predictions based on other data we didn't use to train. This is the whole cross-validation thing. We build the model based on this data, and, he, and we test it against this other label. And this particular example, I think, was done with all persons' data, and including these mislabeled data. And what we found is, well, it's pretty good at predicting things in general. So it gets, in fact, most of the time it's off person, gets these sojourns, for example, to walking most of the time, etc. But there's some big mislabelings here. 
Um, you know, while it gets certain bands quite right, you know, it's saying that this period of, for example, standing is preceded by sitting and things, whereas in fact it was preceded by off person. Um, it would often mistake off person for sitting because sitting is a lower, it's a lower um, um, energy activity and it can look similar to off person, to a phone that's simply stored off person, okay? Um, and uh, uh, we were doing so based on several different types um, of data. We sought to judge um, uh, this situation, but um, our, our attention was distracted by the fact that we had these very different levels of quality of data from different participants. Some participants seem to have labeled the data well. Other participants seem to have labeled it very carelessly. And so we, under, we ended up separating out data from certain participants from others, keeping the higher quality data and, and um, getting rid of the data that seemed extremely suspect. An example of, is this. Um, so this is, for example, off-person data for different individuals here. And you can see some individuals, uh, this is uh, an axis which basically goes along with energy. So as you go to the right here, it indicates there's, you know, there's more rotation going on of the phone and so on. And you were seeing that some participants essentially were labeling as off-person data where this phone was being moved around an awful lot. Now, how that occurs off-person, you know, if they're not engaged in, you know, setting their phone up in a rocket or, or you know, um, uh, having it carried in an autonomous vehicle away from a human carrying it or something, it, it looked very suspect. So, in short, there were a set of individuals for whom the off-person data, amongst other things, looked highly suspect. And it matched very closely what you would expect if they mislabeled it. If they simply forgot to say, oh, I'm no long, it's no longer off-person, forgot to throw that data away. Okay? Fortunately, there was a subset of participants that did have that data. And there's one participant particularly which had... Excellent, excellent data quality um, consistently across these, these different metrics, okay? Um, uh, and uh, it was consistent with an explanation for uh, autocorrelation as well, for explaining the, um, the autocorrelation. And what we found is we created this fake data set from synthetic means, and we tried to classify it. Um, if we posited corruption of the data in this way or if we didn't. And we found that it led to a night and day difference in terms of the observed uh, autocorrelation. Um, and, uh, and what we found is that basically the more corruption that was present from the synthetic data, the data generated by, a, by this um, simulation model, if we corrupted that data more by forgetting, essentially simulating mislabeling, it enormously lowered our ability to classify using, as judging by this F1 score, macro F1 score, which is a measure of accuracy that takes into account both recall and precision or sensitivity and specificity. Basically, this corrupted data, the more, the more mislabeling occurs, the more dramatically yet it, it affects the, the data quality. Um, so... Um, so with all participants, what we found is really quite poor um, ability to, uh, to classify, okay? And um, this occurred across multiple types of HMM structures. So we had HMMs which posited different distributional assumptions for conditional on being a state, what's the distribution of uh, acceleration and rotational speed that we could see. And we, we examined it in a parametric way with bivariate normal, basically multi-dimensional normal distribution, in this case uh, two dimensions, versus a um, uh, kernel density estimate, which is basically a smoothed version of the empirical uh, data. And what we found is our ability to classify, for example, um, uh, own, uh, off person versus on person, our ability to say, to distinguish off person from sitting, standing, and walking, and on and off vehicle was very poor. 
This is for all participants' data, included this data we believed was corrupted. Now, from the very best participant, we see a totally different situation. For this participant, who was extremely careful about labeling, all the signs pointed to this as well as self-reporting from the participant, what we found is actually a very high ability to classify. We could classify with over 80% F score, um, which is the harmonic mean of, of uh, precision and recall. So a harmonic mean that takes into account false positives as well as false negatives. A score of 0 0.82, which is considered an excellent uh, level of classification as judged by uh, uh, F1 score. Um, in this multi-classification uh, multi context, distinguishing off-person sitting, standing, walking, uh, close to 80%, and on and off vehicle, 74%. This parametric model, where we were essentially positing for a given state that the, that the level of acceleration, this is the norm of accelerometer, and I think norm of rotation, where we were saying that that varied in a in a, according to a bivariate normal distribution, actually outperformed the one based strictly on empirical data on the subset of data that was trained against. Um, so we actually had a parametric means of judging it with fewer parameters and with, um, uh, and it gave uh, superior results. Um, so the classification was quite good when used with this subset of, of um, uh, comparison. Um, a subset of participants. Um, uh, there was some further analysis um, that we did about the transition probability matrix. Um, uh, and uh, we examined, for example, this issue of memoryless property. You recall with the probability, transition probability matrix, the idea is that that transition probability matrix tells us conditional that we're currently in a certain state. Um, I'll get back to it here. I think it's there it is. Conditional that we're in a current state right now, it tells us what's the probability we'll go to other states. And from this, we could, we can figure out what's implied by this, how long on average you're in a given, given state, okay? Um, uh, before leaving. Mm -hmm. In this case, 95% confidence you can stay in that state. Um, so within the next time step, and that implies that you'll leave on average in about one out of every 20 time steps. Um, we want to test, is that, how, how, how effective is this memoryless assumption? For example, you might say for off person, if I've put down the phone just recently, here's my phone, Maybe I check it, and I put it down. And you can ask, what's the probability per, let's even just say minute that I pick it up? I would argue probably shortly after I put it down, it's actually probably a slightly higher probability I pick it back up than, say, two minutes later, three minutes later, four minutes later. But probably eventually it gets more and more likely on a permanent basis that I'll pick it up because I want to see what's going on. Maybe for the first minute, I'm more likely because I figure, oh, I might as well, what was that that I just saw? Or, oh, I forgot to check that. Um, you know, I should have checked my friend's post on Facebook or something like that, and then I go, go check it. But it's almost certainly not truly memoryless. We want to see how good was this assumption. For someone where we had good data quality, how good was the assumption that their time in a given state is, is memoryless? <laughs> So here's the highest quality participant, participant model. Okay. Um, so with the memoryless assumption comes in an assumption that the dwell time is exponential or geometrically decreasing. Um, that's, that's what's shown, shown here. So the idea is, look, um, if I consider collectively uh, on-person states versus off-person, what's the chance that if it's on person, any of the off person states that it will stay on person versus off person. If you look at on person, what this suggests is that it's, it's actually pretty memoryless. Like from a state of being on person, um, regardless of 
how many hours it is after that, there's successively lower chance it will be staying on person. Each hour, it seems there's basically the same chance per hour that I'll, I'll put down the phone. No matter if it's been almost not even a full hour since I last had it on, that I've had it on me, or <coughs> two hours, or three hours, the amount of time the amount of time that I spend, um, mumble, um, uh, sorry? No, it, it shouldn't because it's time remaining three hours, 33 minutes. I set it to go much longer. So does it do this? It kicks people off? It knows its master's voice. Um, so, so here, regardless of how long I've had the phone, the chance per successive hour that I'll put it down is pretty similar. These are actually less than an hour. It's a pretty good approximation. Off person, by contrast, is not is not <laughs> a memory mess. Um, if it's been off person for a certain amount of time, it makes it more and more likely at some point that it will stop being off person. It's not just um, every successive hour it's off person, I have a certain chance of picking it up. Same chance no matter how long it's been off person. It rather depends on how long it's been off person. So it's not memoryless, okay? Um, so I'm gonna cut to the chase of this and, and I'm glad to expand on this this afternoon if there's more interest in the formal basis so a lot of things I glossed over here. Exactly how we estimated the parameters of those distributions. Conditional on being in a certain state, say sitting state, standing state. Exactly how did we estimate the parameters of that bivariate normal distribution? Or the, the values in that transition probability matrix. Um, but the big picture here is a story that weaves together many practical aspects of, of uh, machine learning. I want to highlight them because I don't want you to get so distracted by the details of the, the technical details to miss the big, big important story here. Number one, engaging with real data is messy. There are data <coughs> quality issues, there are missing data issues. Data that ostensibly looks very attractive because of volume often has issues in it that are not immediately apparent. And this is point two. Those issues come to relief. You come to sense them when you engage with the data analytically. You could look at the data and just say, wow, what great data. Look at all that data. All this participant label data, they labeled it for you know 14 days straight. We have this with all these different participants. We're in Fat City. Well, the fact is that until you start engaging with it, plotting it out, um, trying to fit models to it, looking at autocorrelation and, and dwell times, you're not going to see the data quality problems. So it requires grappling with it, wrestling with it. And that means budgeting time for that when you try to figure out how long a task is going to take. A third point is that we'll sometimes throw data out of comparisons because it is impaired so fundamentally by data, by data quality. But I want to emphasize a very important and this is a point that goes to the heart of some of the issues with ethics and AI. When we toss data, we need to do so with our eyes wide open for the equity implications of this. Because sometimes the data that is being tossed is impaired in its data quality because it represents groups that are vulnerable, that have lower education, that have less good phones, they can't afford high quality wearables, they're you know, trying to work three jobs and they don't have time to record when they shift state. 
And we, we need to be very cautious about letting our drive for high quality data by throwing away data, making us blind to the needs of vulnerable groups. So tossing data must be done with great care, caution, judiciousness, and awareness of the equity implications. I can expand on this this afternoon if people are interested. Or you can come to our event on quality in, in use of AI in health data this coming fall. Another, another thing I want to emphasize, though, is that models come with assumptions. Hidden Markov models come with certain assumptions. I listed two of them that were very important when they interacted with data quality issues. Assumption one was the fact that the, there was a Markovian assumption made for, tran for transitioning between states. And what that posits is that no matter, in this case, it's no matter how long you've been in a certain state, your chance of going to another state is independent of that length of time. It doesn't matter if you've been in this current state for just one second or 100 seconds or 1,000 seconds. Here, the probability you go to another state is independent of that amount of time, and which state you go to is independent of that amount of time. That's a pretty strong doctrine. Some call it a heroic assumption. There was another assumption that whilst you're in a state, the observations are independent. The variation in the, the observations is, is independent. They are conditionally independent. They're conditional on being in a certain state. They're independent of one another. And autocorrelation um, uh, within a state we're assuming is zero. What we found is that assumption helped us clue into quality assurance uh, problems, but almost certainly it was violated even for the highest quality data. But just because there are these assumptions associated with methods doesn't mean we won't get good results with those methods. Indeed, uh, Kalman filtering, for example, a technique I alluded to yesterday, can be used with nonlinear <coughs> models through linearization, and you can kind of make up for its limits. Um, there's a lot of times that we'll use tools like hidden markup models in a way that we know their assumptions are not quite accurate. Um, uh, for example, the probability of observing a given thing is, is independent no matter the, how long it's been since the last time it was observed. But those models will still often give good results. We just have to be conscious that we are violating this assumption and hopefully test using synthetic data using data that's generated in a synthetic way, performing what's called a, a, a simulation experiment uh, in statistics, we can test out how fragile our method results are to these assumptions. And that's the technique we used a lot here. We tested our models, our hidden Markov model, we used to analyze the real data, using synthetic data as well, where we knew the true situation. So we could judge when it's likely to give good results and when it's likely to be impaired by data quality problems. And that's an extremely valuable technique. And it's something that dynamic models of the sort I showed you yesterday can be very helpful for. Okay? Um, so those are some uh, big lessons uh, from this. Um, uh, I will note that in terms of domain specific issues here. Um, we're interested in redoing this experiment with higher quality data. Um, uh, we have to deal with data quality problems to get better results. And to deal with that, we have to deal with participant burden. Data quality problems don't just appear at random, typically. They appear because of certain issues, like it's too burdensome for participants. And that's another lesson to take away and one that we're going to, uh, to address. And we believe through wearables and more intelligent interfaces and means of, of, of inference, um, uh, live inference, we might be able to do so in a way that's simultaneously less burdensome, more accurate, and less encumbered by quality issues. Okay. 
So, I've given you a glimpse. I've given you a set of slides that systematically map out from base principles and, and in mathematically rigorous ways how these hidden Markov models operate, are defined, um, uh, that, that characterize um, their use, the source of these transition probability matrices and these uh, uh, and, and the use of distributions conditional on being in a state for observations. I would suggest you look at them, consider looking at them over lunch if you're interested. If there is more interest in this, I could walk you systematically through that uh, this afternoon. Absent that, I will be going over some material to put this material in context of the material we saw yesterday and take them a bit further yet. Okay. Um, if you have interest in any of the data collection systems, I'm also happy to, to talk about that as well as additional data sources yet. So um, I will leave uh, now. I will be back at, I believe it's, uh, is it 1 or 1.30? 1 o'clock uh, to deliver 